Okay, good morning, everyone. So today, so I will finish the discussion regarding to um, aggregate demand and the aggregate supply curve or model, right? So just remind you, next Monday, we will have our third midterm. Uh, so once I finish the discussion for new material today, and so on Monday, sorry, Wednesday, this Wednesday, so we will have a review session for the, for the midterm three, right? So where we are. So we are in the chapter again, so this is another chapter trying to understand the determination of the GDP, right? So again, so as I just mentioned earlier, so the GDP, so there are three ways to look at GDP. One is through expenditure. The other is through product. Now, so expenditure essentially coming from the demand side. And product essentially will look at GDP through the supply side. So then so we have income that's going to connect expenditure and product, right? Because or, or we produce, uh, we are going to return as income to the household. And then so all the income is going to be spent on what we produce, right? So when we look at demand, so we look at aggregate demand, right? So remember, I'll remind you how we get this downward slope aggregate demand curve. So this aggregate demand curve just says the price increase the aggregate expenditure will decline, right? So that's coming from wealth effect and interest rate effect, right? So the aggregate demand. And then later we look at aggregate supply, but we start with short run aggregate supply. So what is aggregate? Why is the aggregate supply is upward slope in the short run, all right? Or in other words, why price increase, the aggregate supply increase. Why the firm want to expand? Why the firm want to produce more in the short run if price increase? So this is coming from sticky wage. Right? So if they cross each other and then so we are and we are enters a equilibrium. So this is a short run equilibrium. Right? So today I'm going to explain to you what is long run equilibrium. Right? So in the short run, so the short run can be supply and aggregate demand is going to decide how the equilibrium will look like, right? So that's going to give you equilibrium price and equilibrium quantity, right? So this is um, sh a short run equilibrium. And then we have look at four possible shocks to the economy, right? So I can write down here. So you have supply shock, you have demand shock positive supply shock, negative uh, supply shock, positive demand shock, negative demand shock. Okay, just remind yourself, so how those is gonna affect price? Here's price in equilibrium. And the uh, quantity, quantity in equilibrium. Right? How these four different type of shock is gonna affect our equilibrium price and equilibrium quantity, right? So, Essentially, if the supply shock, the impact on the price and the quantity will be opposite. Or in other words, if it's a supply shock, so either, so for example, if it's a positive supply shock, so the price will decline and the quantity will increase. Negative supply shock, price will increase and the quantity will decrease. On the other hand, if the demand shock, and both price and the quantity will move in the same direction. If it's a positive demand shock, right? So the price will increase and the quantity will increase. On the other hand, negative demand shock, both price and the quantity will decrease, right? So this is quite important because that's gonna tell you whether our economy typically receive a demand shock or a supply shock, right? Like here, so in this case, in the first slide, we see there's a negative demand shock. So you can see, so both price and the quantity will decline, right? Also, you want to ask yourself or review the earlier slides, what leads to a demand shock or what leads to a supply shock, All right? So we have a look at these, there are three different cases, right? Okay. Uh, I think, are we here? I'm not sure. All right, so yeah, so that's the slide where we live, right? So 
the most uh, difficult challenge to the economy is called stagflation. So stagflation is a invented word. So stagflation essentially is combined two things. One is stagnant, S-T-A-G-E stands for stagnant. Okay, meaning so the economy is slowing down. Right? Inflation, that refers to inflation, meaning price increase. Right? So essentially, this is a combination of inflation and a falling aggregate output. Right? And it's caused by a negative supply shock. Right? So that creates a lot of trouble to our economy. Okay? So this is the most, challenge, uh, most challenging things to the economy. So if we look at history, <clears throat> okay, so we do experience um, the stagflation around this time period, right? So the economy is falling at the same time, the price, uh, price level went up. Okay. So now we are going to move to long run macroeconomic equilibrium. So when we say the economy is in long run macroeconomic equilibrium. When the point of short run macroeconomic equilibrium is on the long run aggregate supply curve. So like this background picture tells, essentially, so this long run macroequilibrium is an equilibrium on top of another equilibrium, right? So when I say equilibrium on top of another equilibrium, essentially just we need the short run macroequilibrium is on top of long run aggregate supply curve. Okay. So maybe you can look at this diagram to understand what we mean uh, one equilibrium on top of another equilibrium. Okay. So the review we just had, we look at so, uh, short run aggregate supply cross with aggregate demand. Okay. They cross each other, so we enter the short run Aggregate, uh, short run equilibrium. Now we require this short run uh, equilibrium will be the same or will coincide with long run aggregate supply. Okay? So, in some sense, what we need is YE equal to YP. What is YE? YE coming from uh, aggregate demand equal to short run aggregate supply, right? So this is our short run equilibrium. So the short run equilibrium gives us PE and a YE. So now in the long run equilibrium, we want this YE coming from this short run equilibrium equal to YP. What is YP? It's our potential GDP. So the potential GDP is given by long run aggregate supply. That's gonna determine by technology. Determined by the capital stock the economy has. Determined by employment. It means long run employment. By natural rate of employment. Okay? So in long run equilibrium, so we need these two coincidence. Okay? So this is long run macroeconomic equilibrium. Okay. Now we are ready to use the uh, demand and supply equilibrium model to understand what happens if there's a shock to the economy. But certainly, so there can be a demand shock or supply shock. Okay. So we will see so how the equilibrium adjusts through demand side or supply side. Right? So you're gonna see the so the economy is gonna to move to a new short run equilibrium, but eventually the economy is going to return. Okay? So this is like shock, okay? shock to the economy. But eventually, so the economy is going to return to the long run equilibrium. So, or there's an adjustment because it's an adjustment. Okay. So now we need, we need to understand how the economy is going to respond and how the economy is going to adjust. Okay. So let's start with 
a negative dimension. Okay? So originally we are here. We are at E1. Right? So E1, what happened in E1? The short run aggregate equilibrium. We produce at our potential output level. Okay, so this is at E1. Now, if there's a negative aggregate demand shock, okay, just imagine if there's a collapse in housing market. Okay, if there's an expectation, so the the economy is going to slow in that, right? And then the answer, aggregate demand will decline. Okay. So this decline in aggregate demand is going to be represented by a left side shift of the aggregate demand curve. Right? So now immediately the economy is going to enter the new short run equilibrium of E2. Okay? So compare with E1, so what are we seeing? So we are going to see lower price, price decline. And Y is going to decline as well. So we produce less than our potentially uh, can produce, right? So this is negative demand shock, right? So both is going to go. And so if we are hit by a negative demand shock, okay, and so we produce different from what we potentially can produce. And we call this gap a recessionary gap. So this is called a recessionary gap, essentially, if it's called a fall in, in output. Okay. And in some sense, so because of this recessionary gap, you're gonna see in the short run, the inflation rate will be high, okay? or there is a higher, sorry, not inflation, unemployment. So in the short run, due to this negative demand shock. So we will see a high unemployment. Okay, so this is what happened in short run. Now, similarly, we can look at what happened if there's a positive demand shock. Okay, so now the positive demand shock will push the aggregate demand curve to the right. Okay, okay so the reason why we may have a positive demand shock could be a housing market boom, right? So a negative demand shock could be housing market collapse. Okay? Now, instead of collapse, we have a housing market boom. Or instead of uh, expectation of um, slowing down in economy, now everyone expecting so the economy is going to boom. In, okay? And then so consumer confidence is very strong and everyone want to increase their spending. So the aggregate demand will move to the right hand side. So now we are going to change from E1 to E2, right? So we enter a new equilibrium. In this new equilibrium, what are we seeing? So we produce more than we potentially can produce. Price is higher than the original long run equilibrium, right? And so we call this an inflationary gap. Okay, so this is compared with recessionary gap. Okay, so this is called inflationary gap, largely because the price is increasing. Okay, so at the same time, so this inflationary gap or this positive demand shock has, impl has implications on labor market. Now we produce more than we potentially could, can produce. So that just means the unemployment rate is low. Okay, so in the short run, the unemployment rate will be very low due to this positive shock that generate an inflationary gap. Okay, so this is the second case. Now we can summarize what we discussed. Recessionary gap caused by, typically is caused by a negative Demand shock. Right? So now aggregate output is below potential output. On the other hand, inflationary gap, typically caused by a positive demand shock, now the aggregate output is above potential output. 
What is output gap? Is the percentage difference between actual output versus potential output, right? So when there's a recessionary gap, it means the actual output is below we potentially can produce and output gap is going to be negative or negative output gap. On the other hand, if there's inflationary gap, and then we produce more than we potentially can produce. So you have a positive output gap. So the output gap is defined by or is calculated by this formula. Okay. So the, and the numerator is the difference between we actually produce versus we potentially can produce. In the denominator is our potential output. All right, so that's going to give us the output gap. All right, so now the question is what will happen next? So this is after a demand shock, as we have seen just a few uh, slides ago, right? So if it's a positive demand shock, and then you can see we have inflationary gap. If it's a negative demand shock, we have recessionary gap. Now we are interested to see what happens next. Okay. So the answer to the, this question, what happened next? If we, under, if, we, if we understand this. So that's going to have important implication for policymakers. So the policymakers, basically the government, the Congress, okay, so they can come up accordingly the appropriate policy tools or policy response to help the economy. Right. All right. So as we are going to see next, so in general, the economy will adjust, will correct itself in the long run. Right. Okay. But long run, as Keynes famous say, in the long run, we are all dead. Right. So now we are going to focus on short run adjustment instead of long run. Okay, so that's what we are going to do next. So this is after a positive demand shock, right? Where we are, we start from E1. And then, so a positive demand shock shift the demand curve to the right. So this is step number one. Okay. And then, so you can see in step number two, so now we are going to move to E2. Right? So in E2, so what are we seeing? So there's an inflationary gap. Okay. Price increase. Output exceed potential output. Okay. So with this inflationary gap, so that means unemployment rate will decline in the short run. Right? Uh, so this decline, uh, this decline in unemployment rate in the short run, largely caused by what? Caused by sticky wage. Cause, cause because this is in the short run, so you have a positive demand shock price increase. In the short run, the wage rate are sticky; they cannot adjust. So we have this upward slope, short run aggregate supply curve due to sticky wage, right? Okay, so this sticky wage is going to lead to increase in aggregate supply in the short run, right? Because to the business or to employers, so they find out it's profitable if they expand their production, right? Due to sticky wage, right? So that means the unemployment will decline because everyone is, is hiring additional workers. Right? Unemployment decline. So that is going to put some pressure on labor market. Why is that? If unemployment declines, meaning, so it's very easy to find a job. 
Now, for the business, if they want to hire an ideal candidate, what they must do? So they must increase wage, right? Eventually, they must increase wage to attract workers. Now, if the wage eventually will increase, how would that affect the short run aggregate supply? So that means the short run aggregate supply will decrease. And why the short run aggregate supply decrease? Is because the unemployment rate decline. And why unemployment rate decline? Is because sticky wage and because inflation. Right? But then you ask one step further. So why price increase? Why there's inflation? It's because there's a positive demand shock. Right? So this is reverse engineer. So forward. So essentially because, let me write down, because a demand shock, positive demand shock, leads to price increase. Right? And the price increase because of sticky wage. So that's going to lead to supply increase. Unemployment is going to decline. So unemployment decline, that's going to pro, um, put some pressure on the labor market, right? Because that, that implies it becomes difficult to find workers. So that leads to eventually, that's going to lead to wage increase. So wage increase, that's going to eventually lead to aggregate supply or decline. So eventually we move from E2 to e, E3, right? So once we are in E3, you find out we are in a long run equilibrium. But now if we compare this new long run equilibrium with our original starting point, the only difference is price. Because right? we return to our potential GDP, but the price increased from P1 to P3. So this, what would happen? after a positive demand shock. Okay. On the other hand, so we can look at what happens if there's a negative demand shock. Okay. So the story will be exactly opposite to what we just discussed. Right? So initially we are at E1. Now, due to a negative demand shock, the demand curve shifts to the left. Okay. So that's going to cross the aggregate supply curve, the short run aggregate supply curve at E2. Okay. Now you can see Y decline and the P decline. Okay. Okay. Similarly, due to the sticky wage, so the decline in price. Implies, implies business will reduce hiring. Okay? Uh, so now the business reduce hiring, so that just means unemployment rate will increase. Okay? So this, this is caused by this recessionary gap. So next step, due to high unemployment rate, the workers will respond. How they're going to respond? They're going to respond by taking jobs at a lower wage. This is because everybody understand it's difficult to find a job. So now as a worker, I'm willing to work for a lower wage. Otherwise, I will have zero wage. Right? So lower wage is better than nothing. So that leads to the wage rate decline. So a lower wage rate is a positive news to supply side. So that is going to lead to the aggregate supply. Again, this is short run aggregate supply. To shift to the right hand side. Or in other words, so that's going to have an increase in aggregate supply. 
Now you can see the economy is going to adjust from E2 to E3. So in E3, we reach the long run equilibrium again. In the sense, the economy is going to produce at the potential output level. Right? So we can compare E3 with E1. So this is what the economy will look like after a negative demand shock. And we find out the only difference is price. Now the price will decline or drop from P1 to P3. Right? So this is compared with a positive demand shock. After a positive demand shock, after the economy adjusts itself, you can see, you can see, so with a positive demand shock, the price will increase. But with a negative demand shock, the price will decline. Right? So this is how the economy is going to respond. Okay. Now, here is a discussion. Right? So this asks you with a partner answering the following questions. The AD and AS model we just discussed is said to have a self-correcting mechanism. Self-correcting mechanism. And explain to each other what this means and how this self-correcting mechanism works and use a graph to e illustrate your answers. Okay. So, in, so let me just redo the exercise. Okay, let me just redo the exercise. Let me use a, okay, use a blank page okay, to, uh, to, do the, to redo the exercise, right? So where we start? We start with, So this is short run aggregate supply, aggregate demand. This is long run aggregate supply. Okay. So let's say for example, if there is a positive demand shock, positive demand shock. And then, so we are going to see, let's use different color to highlight. Let's use red one. Okay. And then, so the aggregate demand is going to shift to the right hand side. And then, so in the short run, we are going to look at the short run aggregate supply with the aggregate demand. So you can see the equilibrium because the multiple here. So originally we are here. So now we are here. Let's just label the E1 and the E2. Right? And clearly you can see there is a gap. So this is a YP. This is a Y2. Clearly there's a gap and this is a positive gap. We call it inflationary gap. Right? Okay. So now we are in an inflationary gap. What happened next? So due to this inflationary gap, and, and uh, also because of the sticky wage, okay? so that's going to this, the economy to expand. Or in other words, that means unemployment rate will be low or unemployment is gonna decline. So now this decline in unemployment rate is going to put some pressure on the labor market. And in particular, that, that's going to put some pressure on the wage. And eventually, that's going to lead to the wage to decline. And why is that? Just imagine if, if everybody can find a job, and it's easy to find a job. Okay. Uh, sorry, so this, this, this is not correct. So this is not wage going to be, wage will increase. Okay, if everybody find out it's easy to find a job, okay, and from the worker side they become picky. From the um, producer side they find find it's difficult to fill their job vacancy. Okay, so that is going to lead to a higher wage, so that 
the business they can fill their job opening. So increasing wage that's going to that's going to play as a negative supply shock. Right? So this negative supply shock is gonna push the aggregate supply, the short aggregate supply to the left hand side. So now we go to here. So until we reach this point, so we are E3. Right? So essentially, we move from E1 here to E2 here, and then E3 here. OK, so as a homework, so you may want to do the opposite. So what happens if there's a negative demand shock, and how the economy is going to respond? Right. Let's back to our slides. Suppose an economy is in short run equilibrium. The level of real GDP is less than potential GDP. Which of the following is true? It, because we produce less than we potentially produce, that means that means we have a recessionary gap. Okay. And typically we we say so the problem of our economy is caused by demand shock. Right, so no, the reason why we say that is because we look at four possible shocks to the economy. And a compare, compare the data with what the model would suggest. Right, by that comparison, we find out most of the time, the economy looks like shocked by a demand shock instead of a supply shock. So that's why, so most of the time, so we, we are gonna focus on the demand shock. Now, if we have seen a recessionary gap, and also because of the demand shock, this must be a negative demand shock, okay? So this is based on what we just learned. So now let's see, so which option is correct? Let's go one by one. A, in the long run. Nominal wage will fall and the SA, SRAS curve will shift left, restoring the economy to potential output. Okay, because we are in a recessionary gap. Okay. So, in a recessionary gap, meaning unemployment rate is high. Right? Unemployment is high. Unemployment rate is high, and eventually, what will happen to the wage? The wage eventually will drop. And why the wage will be draw? Because there are people who cannot find jobs. So they are willing to work for a lower wage. Right? So the wage will drop and then the short run aggregate supply will shift to right hand side or increase. Right? So that's going to restore the economy. So the first one, the only incorrect part is this. Right? So wage will fall. That's correct. But the short accurate supply curve will shift to right. Okay. So the second option is correct. Okay. Now let's look at another one. Suppose short run equilibrium real GDP for the economy is greater than potential GDP. So that means we are in an inflationary gap. Again, so we consider demand shock. So this means this is a positive demand shock. Now let's see what that implies. A, nominal wage has to adjust upward as the economy moves from the short run to the long run. So in the short run, you have inflationary gap, the positive demand shock, right? We produce more than we potentially can produce. Our employment rate will low, and eventually everyone can find a job, and, and the business is hard to find a worker. So they must raise the wage. So that's correct. Nominal wage will just upward right so if the nominal wage adjusts upward okay and that's going to have implication on the long run and right? now let's look at a second so the level of unemployment is very low that's great so the reason why nominal wage will adjust upward is exactly because unemployment is very low and then why unemployment rate is very low is because of inflationary gap and the sticky wage C, jobs are plentiful. That's the same as B, 
and D to reach Laura equilibrium aggregate supply, short run aggregate supply will shift to left. That's correct. That's correct. Essentially, this is the short run aggregate supply will decline. And what caused the short run aggregate supply decline is because wage eventually will adjust upward. Right? So the answer is E. A, B, C, D, they are all correct. Okay, so I would uh, uh, give you a five minutes break. During the break, so I would ask you to work on this yourself. I use a graph of AD and S as a model to explain long run economic growth. All right, so I'm going to take a five minute break. After the break, we will continue our discussion. 